Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's, game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from Olympia to now. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. And today we're going to really kick things off for the show by going back in time just a few millennia to talk about the ancient origins of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, or the OG Olympic Games, if you will, that took place in Olympia, Greece. Uh, we are going to be splitting up this topic into two parts, because, Sarah, it turns out it's really difficult to fit 1,200 to 1,500 years of history in just one episode. Yeah, that's a lot of time to cover. It is, and... One of the things I realized while doing the research for this episode is we're still learning new things. There are still active archaeological sites in Olympia. They are still digging things up. And on that note, before we get into some of the highlights for the episode, I do want to give a quick shout out to one of my favorite podcasts, which is called You're Dead to Me. Uh, it is a BBC podcast. I love those British people out there. And if you haven't checked it out, Definitely go give it a listen, but they are a history slash comedy podcast, and they did an episode on the ancient Olympic Games that I took a lot of information from. So uh, this episode owes a lot to the research that they did, but there were only certain things that they covered, and I wanted to go a lot deeper. So if you are interested in learning more about the ancient Olympic Games, in our show notes, we will have links to all of our different research sources, including a link to that episode of You're Dead to Me. I'm not a history expert. I just really like it. So that being said, uh, Sarah, how about we give everyone a couple of highlights of what we're going to talk about in the episode today? All right. First up, uh, the OG Games took place at Olympia, home of the Temple of Zeus, going for at least 1,200 years, started by the Greeks and running through the Christianized Roman Empire. Yeah. And during that time, there were a total of 23 events featured in the games, though there were no more than 20 that were ever featured in one single Olympiad. And all those events included categories that we would recognize even to this day, uh, like running, jumping, discus, um, combat events like wrestling, and then some events that we wouldn't really recognize today, such as chariot racing, uh, though obviously we still have different forms of equestrianism. The ancient Olympics are widely considered the official birth of sports since records were kept and featured regular scheduled events, judges, etc., well, yeah, they had to see who was leading in the, the medal count, just like we do today. Um, it's funny how those traditions have continued <laughs> on. Yeah. Um, and, of course, uh, one tradition that hasn't really carried on, though we'll talk about it a little bit, is that the ancient Olympic Games were started as a religious festival dedicated to some good old Zeus worship for all Greeks. Well, at least as long as they were male. And that's a topic, of course, we're going to see come up quite a bit, even with the modern Olympic and Paralympic movement. And on that note, before we officially get into talking about the origins of the games, I, I want to talk a little bit about the similarities between uh, religion and sports. And Sarah, have you ever really thought about that between the two? Come to think of it. I do think that we can see some similarities. I don't know if I've ever spent too much time dwelling on that. Um, your temple, quote unquote, is the stadium, right? You've got your followers gathering together and uh, participating in various forms of celebration. And they're united by this common cause. And One more thing on that is also thinking yeah. about... How, um, me personally, when I go to church, we sing music, we mm -hmm. pray, um, we listen to somebody and, and there have been times that I have thought when I go to a major sporting event, um, <laughs> there sometimes is chanting that goes on for your favorite team. Um, if you watch Sunday afternoon football here in the U S you see chanting, um, during college football games, you hear music, you see the marching band. So it kind of, you know, I hate to say that just because you go to a sporting event, you're worshiping the sport, but thinking about, <laughs> thinking about the similarities, like you said, of going to a temple, yeah. an arena, 
Um, it's pretty wild to think about. Yeah, it's not a perfect analogy, obviously, but uh, but it is interesting to me that really the birthplace of what we think of as sports, the Olympics, did start off as a religious celebration. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a quick break, um, maybe say a prayer or two. <laughs> um, and then we will, <laughs> and then we'll jump right into uh, talking about the origins of the Olympic Games and where exactly they came from. Sarah, as you mentioned, you don't know many Zeus worshiping people. Um, in all truth, neither do I. So I, I think that's one of the first questions: is how exactly did the Olympic Games, which became known for sporting events, how did they start off as a religious festival? And what exactly did that look like? Um, this is actually one of the reasons we can't perfectly pinpoint when the Olympics started because they weren't being documented for a while when the, these worship services and these festivals were taking place. It kind of grew out of that over time. Uh, so here's what we have learned about the festival side of it that gave birth to the sporting events. So in ancient Olympia, archaeologists have identified that there were probably around 70 altars specifically dedicated for the worship of Zeus. Um, Olympia is nowhere close to Mount Olympus, but it was named in honor of Mount Olympus, where, of course, Zeus was regarded as the king of the Olympic gods, right, and goddesses. Now, the original festival would last for about five days, and the first two and a half of those were really, in the beginning, just dedicated for religious activities. Uh, as you were talking about, things like chanting and praying, offering sacrifices, uh, the priests obviously had a big role in that. And it is thought that there was some kind of opening ceremony. On the third day, so right in the middle of the festival, there was a gigantic sacrifice made called the Hecatome. Uh, this was a slaughter of a hundred cattle at one time in Zeus's honor. And there would always be a small portion of the sacrifice that was offered ceremonially to the gods, but then the rest of the sacrifice was actually given to the participants. So they had this really big Olympic barbecue, apparently. Can you um, imagine that happening in today's games? Oh, man. <laughs> I, I would like to say that I could imagine, but you have to think about the fact that in today, because it is globalized, not everyone eats meat. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's no way so, that I could see this going over well. Um, oh, yeah. in you, you would have seen so many people. You would have protests outside of the stadium about slaughtering the cows. It would not go over super well. Uh, but that's just how they did things back then, having this massive uh, barbecue. It, and it also makes me curious how many people came to the Olympics just so they could get a free meal? Hmm, that's a good question. I I would go. <laughs> Moving past the cow slaughtering, uh, the religious rituals in the festival, um, they would have some at the end as well. So there was apparently some sort of closing ceremony to let everyone know, okay, it's over, now pack up and go home. Uh, but that's usually when they would officially announce the winners, give them the crowns of laurel leaves, um, and make a big deal out of all the victors because... Sarah, they weren't just competing to win a race, right? Like, this was about eternal glory. Once you were an Olympic champ, you were an Olympic champ for the ages, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, I know I'm jumping way far ahead here, but just, oh, that's fine. just to bring it to um, a kind of a way to visualize visualize this in modern times. Um, if you watch the modern Olympic games, then the tradition right now is that the marathon winners are given their gold medals and well, all their medals during the um, closing ceremony. And it's just kind of a way I think that they've decided to honor that tradition of this being a moment. And I mean, the marathon is considered one of the premier events of the Olympics uh, when you look back right. to history. So um, I, I just think that's kind of cool to, to think about. We see that even now. Yeah, and we'll talk about the marathon more, of course, when we get into the modern Olympic movement. But the marathon was, it wasn't a part of the ancient games. 
uh, because the Battle of Marathon hadn't even happened yet. <laughs> right? yeah. uh, but the marathon, as we think of it, was actually invented specifically for the modern Olympic movement. So uh, that's, yeah, that's a great point. They were kind of drawing from that history of giving the awards out on the very last day. They've kind of kept that with the marathon happening mm -hmm. um, at the end of the modern Olympics. That's a great point. The original name of the games in uh, ancient Greek is uh, Olympiakoi Agonois, which is roughly translated to Olympic Agonies. And then the Olympiads were actually named not after the host city like we do today because there was really only one host city, <laughs> Olympia, uh, but they were named after the winner of the Stadion, which was the first event and the only event for the first 13 documented Olympiads. And that word stadion is the root word of our word in English for stadium. And it was right around 192 meters, so just shy of what we would think of as the 200-meter dash. The Olympic Stadium there in Olympia did become the most famous in the ancient world, so it did become a, a sort of tourist attraction to, to some degree. The Romans continued the tradition of the Olympics after they invaded and conquered Greece around the 2nd century BC. Uh, so the Romans were very much about, once they conquered an area, kind of letting people obviously not be free, but continue on in their traditions. They didn't come in and say, you have to change your religion, you have to change your culture. They kind of let people do whatever they were already doing. They just said, you're going to pay us tax now, and we're going to have troops around to maintain the peace. Um, not saying that's uh, the right <laughs> attitude, but this is where we see the Olympics being able to continue because the Romans were just totally cool with it and allowing it to continue on. It actually got really popular with the Romans to the point that there were even Roman emperors who competed, and we'll talk about this in part two, uh, but we'll talk specifically about Nero and how he quote unquote won six events uh, by, you know, bribing the judges, if not with literal money, just with, uh, you know, threats because he was Nero. Cheating uh, during an Olympic Games? We've never heard of no, that. No, no, that would never happen. And then as we already mentioned, there were 23 total events that were documented during the ancient uh, Olympics run, pun intended. And there were no more than 20 events uh, competed at a single Olympiad. So you did sometimes see events be popular for a while and then drop off. But for the most part, uh, especially during their heyday, you would see around 20 total events occur. Um, now, in contrast to that, the most recent summer games in Tokyo featured 33 sports, but a total of 339 medal events. Can you imagine if we waited to give all the medals out for the closing ceremony, how long that would take? I mean, now I kind of want to want, I wonder, can we like go watch all the medal <laughs> ceremonies and string them together to see how long they took? That'd be a very long yeah. time. Um, we feel like it takes that long when we go to my son's gymnastics event because him still being at the lower levels as a kid, they divide at a lot of the meets. They divide them up by age. So they get medals for, you know, all of the events, but also at each age. And then, you know, at this level, depending on the meet, sometimes they go out six places. We've been to meets where they gave out medals for up to 10 places. So sometimes it feels like we're watching 339 medals get awarded because we sit there for so long waiting for everything to wrap up. Hope you have lots of snacks. <laughs> So what about the Olympic truce? Did the Greeks declare peace with one another during the Olympics? Yeah, so that's one of the common things that most people kind of know about the Olympics, right? Is, uh, is A, that there was this peaceful period, and then B, that they didn't wear clothes, right? It wasn't truly peace as we would think about it, where they would stop completely fighting with each other, but rather 
this was the time period where ambassadors would get sent out sometimes as far in advance as a year before the Olympics. And they could start delivering the news about when it was going to happen. Uh, they could remind people it was going to be happening so they could start training if they wanted to be a part of it. And those envoys couldn't be attacked while they were traveling. Um, there was also supposed to be protection when people were headed to Olympia for the games. They were supposed to be safe from attack. So there wasn't an agreement between them. Uh, the city states that they would stop all warfare, but just specifically in regards to traveling to and from the Olympic Games. You couldn't carry um, arms uh, into the territory of Ellis, which was the closest city state to Olympia. Now, these heralds or envoys, ambassadors, whatever you want to call them, uh, they were called the Spondoferoi, and they were sent from that nearby city-state of Ellis to advertise the coming of the games. And of course, that was a job that they had every four years. So just like today, where we've got uh, four years in between summer games, four years in between winter games, uh, that got established uh, by the original Olympic Games. Part of me wishes I could go back in time and be one of those people to announce the games are coming, but then again, I'm a female, so I probably <laughs> wouldn't be allowed. So why exactly did the game start to begin with? Yeah, someone had to have the idea first, right? It right. didn't just happen overnight. It grew over time. Um, uh, which, by the way, if you are listening to this with your kids, this might be a moment that you want to skip ahead a few minutes because... If you know anything about Greek mythology, it's generally not PG or PG-13 rated. So this is your warning to skip if you need to. To answer your question, Sarah, the most commonly agreed origin story of the Olympic Games is the story of Pelops the Demigod. Have you ever heard of this guy? Heard of him, but I can't say that I'm very good with Greek mythology. Yeah, um, I I love Greek mythology, but I actually had not heard this specific story until I, until I started digging into the topic. So if you're familiar at all with Greek um, geography, the Peloponnese, which is in the western side of Greece and where Olympia is located, is named after Pelops the demigod. Okay, hmm. so depending on the source, because there is some disagreement about where Pelops exactly came from, uh, but according to the sources I'm going off of for today, uh, his father was this guy named Tantalus, and he decided to offer Pelops as a sacrifice to the gods. So, great strong father figure, obviously. Um, and when he did this, he cut up Pelops and put him into a stew. So, uh, if you're still listening to this, obviously this is why there's a parental warning. <laughs> now, uh, apparently Tantalus was kind of just a shady figure in general, because when he offered the stew to the gods, most of them felt like it was pretty sus, and that there was something wrong with the stew. So they were like, yeah, no thanks, I just had a Snickers bar, I'm good to go. Except for the goddess Demeter who at the time was grieving the abduction of her daughter Persephone uh, when she got abducted by Hades, which is a whole other story. But anyway, she was sad. She was grieving. Someone's offering her some food. So she took some bites of the stew and she actually ate part of Pelops's shoulder. That's going to come back in a minute. Okay. Tantalus got found out for what he tried to do, and he got banished to Tartarus, which is essentially the Greek, ancient Greek version of hell. And then Pelops was reassembled and resurrected. So this is how he became a, a demigod and not just a mortal human being. Uh, but when he was reassembled, oops, he was missing a part of his shoulder because, well, Demeter had eaten it. So, the gods replaced his shoulder, this is one of the coolest parts to me, they replaced his shoulder with one made of gold and ivory. So yes, Pelops, the origin story protagonist for the Olympic Games, had a prosthetic shoulder, which what? I think is really cool. Yeah, I'm sure you're thinking, but what does this have to do with the Olympic Games? All this is right now is a weird story about cannibalism. Uh, well... <laughs> I trust you. We're so getting here's there. 
We're getting there, I promise. Yeah, so after all of this had happened, uh, the god Poseidon made Pelops his apprentice and uh, taught him how to drive the divine chariot. Uh, which, I don't know about you, but Divine Chariot kind of sounds like a good R&B group name. There was this guy named King Animaeus of Pisa, and essentially, Animaeus had this daughter whose name was Hippodamia. She was uh, this, you know, most beautiful girl in the region. You know the story. That's how all these things start. So, an oracle had come to King Animaeus and had told him that, hey, you're going to be killed by your daughter's husband. So, what did he decide to do? Well, he decided to make a law that any young man who wanted to marry his daughter had to take her away in a chariot. So, they had to kidnap her. Weird, but... Yeah, nothing weird know, about that. It is that. what it is. <laughs> the king's horses were actually a gift from Poseidon, so of course they were supernaturally fast. So... So yeah, so anyone who came along to do that, uh, he would just ride up in his own chariot and spear the person to death, right? Because he figured, as long as she doesn't get married, then I'm safe, right? The oracle can't come true, okay? Now, Pelops came along and fell in love with Hippodamia when he saw her. Uh, he wasn't allowed to live at, you know, Olympia, th that is Mount Olympus anymore, because Zeus was like, this is awkward, you're mortal, we're not, like, you probably need to go down to Earth at this point. Uh, so, Pelops came along, and he convinced this guy named Myrtilus, um, unfortunate name, but there it is, uh, who was the charioteer for King Animaeus, okay? So, Pelops goes up to Myrtilus, and he says, hey, I'm going to try to marry Hippodamia, so I've got to, you know, kidnap her, take her away in the chariot, um, help a bro out, and replace the axle of the king's chariot with wax. So Pelops is, you know, kind of cheating, but, you know, let's face it, uh, Animaeus isn't really playing fair either, okay? So he goes in his chariot, which Pelops was really good with, because as we already learned, Poseidon taught him how to drive the Divine Chariot. Animaeus is chasing after him. The wax in that axle, as it's turning over and over, melts, and King Animaeus is killed. Okay, so again, yes, Pelops cheated in the race, but he won! Yay! <laughs> and then here's... <laughs> and then here's where it gets really kind of weirder, if it isn't already weird enough, is he then decides to organize a chariot race as either a thanksgiving to the gods that he won, or as funeral rites for his now deceased father-in-law, Animaeus. Um, so this is kind of where the religious side comes into it as well, as it's kind of like this act of purification, because he realizes... Yeah, it was wrong for me to kill the guy, but it was the only way I was going to get to marry his daughter. So let's honor his memory, and then everything's cool, mm -hmm. right? Now, supposedly, this race it, that he organized is what inspired the original races that were held at Olympia as part of the festival to Zeus, okay? There is another version of the myth and again, if you're listening to this with little ones, if you haven't already skipped ahead, you might want to skip ahead a little bit more. But there's a version that says that Myrtilus, the chariot driver for the king who helped Pelops cheat, uh, that he was also in love with Hippodamia. And that the reason he agreed to help Pelops was because Pelops said, hey, if you help me out with this, you can have the first night with her. So, ick, if that's actually true. When Myrtilus, according to this other version of the story, when he went to, um, how to put this delicately, when he went to go collect on his part of the agreement, Hippodamia ran away crying. So Pelops, not wanting to reveal the shady deal he had made with Myrtilus, said, eh, and threw Myrtilus into the sea to kill him. But that as Myrtilus was falling in this version of the story, he put a curse on Pelops. Uh, curse you, Pelops, as he fell into the ocean. It's all very cinematic. You can see it, you know, playing out on screen. Now, Pelops went on to become a king, a great man. As I already mentioned, the Peloponnese region was named after him. 
Now, here's one thing that I thought was really cool and made me scratch my head a little bit is not too long ago, some archaeologists actually found a tomb in that region that was dedicated to a king named Pelopion, which kind of suggests that the story may not be completely mythical. Well, I don't want to know that. Well, <laughs> yeah, because there's some really unfortunate <laughs> stuff in here that we want to stay mythical. Um, or we can just be grateful it's history. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and history is full of really awkward things like that. But I think that's really interesting that Pelops may have been at least partially based on a real king from the area. Some people don't agree with that story, even though in the research I did, most do think that the Pelops story is the origin. Uh, but there is a later myth that's attributed to the writer Pindar that states that the festival at Olympia uh, actually involved uh, Heracles, uh, who some people might know as Hercules, uh, the son of Zeus. And according to that story, uh, Heracles established an athletic festival to honor his father Zeus after he had completed his 12 labors. After specifically the labor of having to clean King uh, Aegeus' stables. Uh, King Aegeus ruled the region of Elis, which is close to Olympia. And according to that story, he owned more cattle than anyone else in Greece. So his stables were straight nasty. And in that myth, uh, Heracles rerouted the Peneus and Alpheus rivers in order to clean away all of the filth from the stables. But according to the Greek historian uh, Pausanias, he provides a story about uh, a different guy named Heracles, but not the one that I was just talking about. Um, and that this guy had four brothers, uh, Peneus, Epimedes, Isaias and Idas, uh, who apparently uh, raced at Olympia so that they could entertain the newborn Zeus. And so some people say that's actually the basis of where the, the games originated. Uh, but according to that version of the story, this other Heracles was crowned the victor with an olive wreath, uh, which later on became a peace symbol. And that this also explained the four year interval because he raced against his four brothers. So, you know, the games would come around every fifth year to honor him as the fifth brother when you count the years uh, inclusively. There could be possible, several possible explanations for why the Olympic games started. Uh, but in the end, it was all about Zeus worship, okay? Uh, so he was the god of the competition. Uh, he was the god of military conflict. A lot of the athletes who competed were soldiers as well. Again, there's this kind of weird connection of sports, warfare, religion, all converging in one place. Okay. But Sarah... To give myself a little bit of a break, uh, I want to turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit about uh, not so much the mythology, but the, the actual historical origins of the games. Yeah, so we believe the games may have started earlier in the 10th or 9th century BC. Um, 3,000 years ago, sporting events happening in Minoan Crete, uh, there was bullfighting involving somersaults, uh, which... I want to think about that. Um, I'd like to Can see... Can we bring that back? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I I really want to see this. I want to know what it looked like. We we either need yeah. a movie or we need some... I don't know. Maybe over there um, people reenact it in some way. I don't know. I'm going to look into that. You know, this bull leaping thing kind of makes me think, like, what happened to turn pommel bull into pommel horse? Because that's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> But, you know, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. yeah. This is where yeah. later, later on, I'm going to go down my own little rabbit trail <laughs> about this. Uh, the Minoans held gymnastics in high esteem, which, you know, to this day, gymnastics is still pretty highly regarded. Um, there was also mm -hmm. bull leaping. So here we are with the bulls again. Uh, yep. Tumbling, running, wrestling, and boxing. Uh, the Mycenaeans adopted Minoan games and also raced chariots in religious or funeral ceremonies. 
Homer wrote about heroes participating in athletic competitions to honor the dead, as the Iliad features chariot races, boxing, wrestling, a foot race, as well as fencing, archery, and javelin. The Odyssey also mentions long jump and discus. There was no dedicated military. Everyone was just expected to fight if needed. So most young men were taught to fight and to always be in fighting shape. Uh, sporting, Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. They got to they gotta fight for their country or, well, their city state. Bronze tripods have been found <laughs> at the site of Olympia that date back as far as the 9th century. It's thought that those could have been a prize or, you know, mm -hmm. maybe an actual tripod for a camera. Right? That's possible. Yeah, for the broadcast happening <laughs> for those who couldn't travel um yeah that's, that's interesting because it makes me wonder if kind of like you know with the modern games they have to make more medals mm -hmm. than there are actual winners there's always leftovers in case there's a tie for gold or mm -hmm. you know there's some events like judo where you've got two bronze winners right so it makes me wonder if that was part of the prize these little bronze tripods if Maybe that was the room where they kept all the extras to hold on to for the next Olympia. Ooh, that, maybe that's so. That's interesting. Maybe so. Yeah. I want to get my hands anyway. on one of those. Um, <laughs> some think the games could go even as far back as the 13th century BC. Um, 776 BC is generally accepted as the date of the first Olympics ever. Uh, the date of 776 BC comes from Aristotle, but some propose 765 BC. So on that same kind of note, because that's when people started documenting it, that's when most Western scholars mark as the beginning of history. So... You know, obviously, that's a very Western-centric view of history, uh, but it's kind of cool that, at least for some people, uh, they saw the Olympics as literally making history happen. But uh, to kind of get back to what we do know for sure, uh, the first 200 years of the Games seem to have only had really a regional importance, uh, so people weren't coming from all over Greece in the beginning. Um, and that's why in the records that are kept, you see an early dominance of Peloponnese athletes because they were mostly the only ones participating for that first 200 year period. Obviously, it did grow or we wouldn't be talking about it today. Um, so here's what I'm curious about was, is this. Were the Olympics the only sporting event happening in ancient Greece or, you know, did city states hold their own little league events in between. <laughs> little league established back in ancient right. Greece. Yeah. The Olympiad was part of a cycle of games known as the Panhelic games, which mm -hmm. might sound familiar to some of our listeners. And of course we had the Olympic games, the, the big show um, that we're all familiar with. And then there were the Nemean games, which were held every two years at Nemea at the Temple of Zeus there in Argolis. Uh, then you had the Isthmian games, which were held every two years in Corinth in honor of Poseidon. Mm -hmm. Then you had the Pythian games, which were held in the third year of the Olympiad cycle in the city of Delphi in honor of Apollo. Then Athens also appears to have held events in honor of the goddess Athena. You know, we can kind of think of that of how we have national championships and we have world championships. We have those things happening in between the Olympic and Paralympic Games to this day. So uh, there definitely was a tradition of that starting with the Greeks. All right, so let's talk kind of real quickly about Olympia itself, because there was a lot of this I did not know until I started digging into it some more. As you mentioned earlier, Sarah, uh, the statue of Zeus, the really famous one in the Temple of Zeus that was 30 meters high, was located there in Olympia. That was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And then uh, the Hill of Kronos was right behind the location uh, where they actually do the modern torch lighting ceremony. In fact, uh, nearby to Mount Kronos, there's two rivers, um, the Alphaios and the Kladios rivers. Uh, you know, I also mentioned 
rivers in that story of Hercules before. So again, some people point to those being the same two rivers, just with slightly different names. And then there's uh, there were buildings on the west side of the grounds, specifically for athlete training. And then the stadium and the race course were on the eastern side of the site. And then, of course, the center between those two was the holy area, where the temples for Zeus and uh, Hera were located. Now, the gymnasium building during the Hellenistic era was used for training, and the judges would actually watch the training sessions so that they could decide who would get to compete. So there was a little bit of a, you know, tryout process, mm -hmm. if you will. I was thinking, not everyone. Like yeah, it's like old yeah. school Olympic trials. You kind of had to trim down the field some. So they would do that during that one month before the Olympic Games when all of the athletes would come in to start training. And the judges would kind of say, okay, this person can be in, this person can be in. You can be a spectator or a hot dog vendor, right? Uh, <laughs> someone didn't make the cut. Um, but training sessions were actually open to the public and you could make bets <laughs> on the training of who you thought would get in, who you thought would do, uh, end up being victorious, all those sort of things. So, um, it's funny because, you know, the modern Olympic movement was partially created to purify sports and to kind of remove betting from it, but you saw betting happening at the ancient Olympic games anyways. Um, and then, of course, they also had baths there for the athletes so that they could wash up afterwards because they were all gross and sweaty and nasty afterwards. Yeah, so like locker rooms, but old school. Mm -hmm. So what was it like at Olympia? Was it a big city? Were there things for people to do? No, not really. Um, no one really lived at Olympia other than a small group of priests who had maintained the temples of Zeus and Hera. Otherwise, it was pretty deserted except for the Olympic Games. So this is really interesting to me, and we're going we're gonna to write a blog about this and put it up on the website because there was a lot more I learned about this that we just don't have time to share here. Uh, but it, it makes me kind of question a little bit how we do host cities currently. Like, does it actually make more sense to have a host site where you don't have a lot of people living mm -hmm. um, and is only used every four years for the game? So there's something about that that's actually kind of smart because they didn't have to do major infrastructure changes, right? Um, so if people were attending, there weren't hotels for them to stay in. Uh, there weren't houses nearby that they could rent out. Uh, there was no Greek Airbnb, right? Um, or I guess it would be Hera BNB. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but there was a sort of Olympic village in the sense that you'd have forty to 50,000 people coming in from all over the country, and they would just set up tents, and they would live outside, camping out for five days, enjoying their barbecue, um, it was a huge cultural event. There was lots of mingling and exchanging of ideas. Well, at least for, for men, uh, as we'll get to here in, in a second. And then those spectators, uh, they could watch from the embankments, uh, which was right around the stadium. So they just kind of plopped down with their picnic blanket. And then there was a special terraced area specifically for the judges. So the judges had the best view, obviously, because they had to be able to see if people were following the rules. But otherwise, you just kind of picked a spot and watched it and moved around if you needed to. That sounds really interesting. But me personally, I was like, mm, I don't know if I want to be surrounded by that many people with no sanitation <laughs> and... All the things, yeah. but then thinking it got about, nasty. yeah, it sounds like it. So I don't even know if I'd want to go, but that kind of leads me into my question for you, which is what about women? Were women there at all? Did they have any roles? I mean, were they even allowed to be in a kitchen cooking food for these people? Um, did they have any yeah. roles? Yeah, that's a good point. So, okay. So, yeah, we need to kind of clarify that a little bit. So women were not allowed to compete, obviously. And that's why some people say that the ancient Olympians didn't wear clothes, right? Because they had to know that they were male. But there were actually rare cases of young virgin girls and unmarried women being in attendance and being permitted to watch. There's some different ideas of why that was, whether it was seen as like this purity thing because of the religious aspects. Um, but... Either way, women couldn't, uh, you know, married women could not be spectators. They were not allowed in. Um, 
you know, sometimes they would try to sneak in and there were stories of women sneaking in because they wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to see what was going on. Um, how do you think they were punished for that? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I jumped to execution because it sounds pretty harsh. And we know that back then um, that was pretty common um, for there to be really harsh ding, punishment. Ding, ding, ding. So <laughs> we have I don't, the winner. <laughs> I don't want to think worst case, but I'm going to assume worst case scenario. Yeah, they, they had a special cliff for throwing women off of it who snuck into the Olympics. Um, so there was a notable exception made for a priestess named Demeter because her family was just too high profile. So I guess you could technically get away with it if you were from wealth and <laughs> and had good connections. But that's one of the very few documented instances where a married woman attended and was not thrown off the cliff. Um, there was another story that I found of, now it depends on the source, I, I saw it spelled different ways, uh, but uh, Calipateria or Calipatera, uh, she actually trained her son, uh, Pyceridos, to run. So she was actually his coach and she snuck in because obviously she wanted to watch him compete. And when he won, she got so excited that uh, she threw back her hood that she was wearing and it gave away the fact that she wasn't male. OK, um, now, similar to the other story that I mentioned, she was able to escape penalty of death because she came from a high profile uh, family that was actually filled with Olympic victors. So it was one of those things where they were just like, yeah, you're going to get a pass. But that didn't happen for most people. And. There's a theory that that moment actually incited the rule that all the trainers also had to be naked like the athletes from there on out. OK, uh, so, yeah, so there were a couple women who were able to sneak in and get away with it, but they were the exceptions, not the rule. But I did not know about this until doing the research. They actually held games of their own called the Hurrian Games, named after the goddess Hera because she had a temple there too. And that started around 600 BC, if not sooner. Um, they were probably discontinued, scholars think, around the time that the Romans conquered Greece. So, you know, they had about a 400 year run. Why they stopped, whether it was just because the Romans didn't like the idea of women competing even in their own separate events, um, or maybe they just didn't attract the same level of TV ratings, I'm not sure. But around that time of 200 BC was when the Hurrian Games ended. Um, have you ever heard of this before yourself? I don't think so. It's fascinating. Yeah. It, it is, because it, it throws the Olympics, the ancient games, into a slightly different different light that there was, at least for a sliver of time, um, there was an opportunity for women to be involved in sports and have their their own participation, even though it was never obviously to the same level that the male Olympic Games were. And they only had one event, which was the Stadion, and it was actually a, about one-sixth shorter than the men's version of the race. Of so, course, of course. Yeah, so, you know, obviously not nearly as much glory <laughs> and not as much opportunity, but, you know, I grew up thinking that there were just no women ever, ever, ever at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So to find out that that's not completely true was kind of nice to find out. Yeah, I so, agree. Just like with the Olympic Games, winning was of prime importance. The winners were crowned with reefs of wild olives, just like their male counterparts. Um, you know, just a stone's throw away there at the Olympic Stadium. I guess the women kind of get the last laugh, though, because that area where they used to hold the Korean Games is where they do the Olympic torch lighting ceremony now with Greek women in traditional dress. So... It's kind of cool that maybe there's this, you know, kind of last hurrah from the Hurrian athletes. I see this is once again, and maybe one day this is something that you can work on. I need a movie about this so that I can envision it. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, again, part of why I wanted to start this podcast is because I, I know not everyone wants to watch a thousand movies about the Olympics. So there's only so many scripts I can write <laughs> about it. Uh, but it, but it, would be, it would be interesting because it's a story that really hasn't been told. And that's why I felt like we needed to tell it here. With that being said, we need to head on to the main event, which are the events themselves. All right, running or the foot race. Uh, the first 13 games actually only featured the stadion. Uh, 182 meters or 192 meters is how long the stadion was. There was a stone starting line, so literal starting blocks. Probably not as high tech yeah. as what we're used to seeing today. <laughs> and so if you had a false start on the track, you received corporal punishment. No big deal. Um, yeah. maybe a little more harsh than what we see today. Um, the, Just a tad. Yeah. yeah. The stadium remained the most prestigious event throughout the history of the games, um, which to me is not much of a surprise. Um, there would be preliminary heats held and then the heat winners go to the finals, much like what we see today. Hmm. Um, after 13 Olympiads, two more races were added. The Dialis came in 724 BC. It was roughly equivalent to the 400 meter race. This was two back and forth laps of the stadium. So don't think about it just being one lap around the track. Um, it was actually back and forth. Um, so I wonder how that would look different in the time and everything today compared to just people being able to go one lap around the track. Yeah, I mean, it definitely changes up your technique if you have to either like go around something and run back or whether you had to like touch a wall or, you know, however it was that they did it. Um, that completely changes your strategy as a runner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Delicos came around in 720 BC, which was a longer distance endurance, endurance race, which I guess this would be up your alley, Jonathan, um, mm -hmm. that could have been between 7 to 20 stadium lengths, which is 1,500 to 5,000 meters long. Uh, some say it was as long as 24 stadions, which is about four and a half kilometers. Later on, it appears the endurance race actually became the first event. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I did find in different sources these big differences. There's a huge difference between 1,500 meters and 5,000 meters. And it almost makes me wonder if the reason they can't nail that down is because maybe the race got longer over time. Maybe it's one of those things where they said, well, they've been running for 1,500 meters for a while. What if we made it a little bit more challenging and made it longer? <laughs> but it's interesting to me that it became the first event. And I don't know if that's because people were excited about it or if because they were like, oh, this race is so long. Let's just get it out of the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it is really interesting to consider the reasoning behind it. The pentathlon was introduced in 708 BC, and no surprise, it consisted of five sports. Uh, you mm -hmm. had the foot race, the long jump, wrestling, javelin, and discus. One thing that is really interesting is that the pentathlon sports were all done in a day. So you didn't have time to rest. Yeah. It, everything happened in one day. Jeez. Um, the event order was jumping where there was the use of the halterous hand weights and there was also music accompanying this event. Um, I wonder if there was a little bit of choreography involved, kind of like gymnastics for the women <laughs> or, or what, but then you had discus, the stadion, javelin and wrestling, uh, to close it out. And it was unknown how the winner was selected. But three event victories may have guaranteed the overall victory. Next, we have discus. And much like many of the other sports that we continue to talk about, we learned that discus originated from warfare. Uh, it was the practice of throwing disc-shaped objects at the enemy to obstruct them or injure them. And it could cause broken bones. So that's I imagine. pretty pretty tough. Um, bronze yep. discuses have been found with inscriptions around 30 centimeters across, and they weighed about six kilograms. According to worldathletics.org, the modern metal throwing disc weighs around two kilograms. So 
that means that the discus they were using in the ancient Olympics was three times the weight. And it was also a little bit bigger. The modern ones are 22 centimeters. Um, so, so yeah, so it looks like uh, we've kind of scaled back a little bit. I'm curious how far they could throw that, uh, but I, I think you might have the answer to that. Yeah, they could throw the discus up to 24 meters. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's really impressive considering it was a heavier <laughs> discus. So Right, definitely. Um, awesome. Cool. All right, then we have the long jump. Um, with the long jump, they would actually stand still. They would hold weights in each hand to throw forward. There would be mm -hmm. three standing jumps. And these jumps would be accompanied by flute music. Uh, so it, it's interesting that the long jump back then, it looked a lot different than what we have today, mm -hmm. but it's interesting that I guess there was kind of almost like a dance quality to it, uh, with them not running up and jumping, but starting out still throwing the weights in front of them and doing three jumps. So it's kind of like this weird combination of long jump triple dance or triple dance <laughs> triple jump and ballet i guess right. yeah, yeah. It, hmm. it definitely a component of grace is what seems to be here um hmm. so yeah some do say could have been a running start like the triple jump um oh, okay yeah and they use the weights to help them leap further distance kind of in a pendulum motion um, hmm. the greatest distance that we have recorded is 16 and a half meters, which probably okay. required anywhere from three to five jumps. Oh yeah. So I watched a documentary. I didn't think about it until now. So there were these guys in the documentary who tried to reenact the ancient events to figure out exactly what happened. And that's what they were saying is that looking at the recorded distances that they can only get those distances by doing three to five jumps. So it's really interesting. They're historians, but they try, they take what we know about the ancient Olympic games and then they try to reenact to get as close to figuring out what it would have looked like. Um, did they use different techniques than what we use today? Uh, it was kind of interesting. I'm like, how do you sign up for that job? <laughs> yeah, I want to sign up for that. Finally, the javelin. The javelin used a short rope for propulsion to make it go farther and direct it in a safe direction away from spectators. So it's really interesting that Good call. <laughs> we, yeah, that we often think about how so many of these things began as um, a method to fight the enemy, um, but at least they were considerate of the spectators and recognizing that they were not, in fact, the enemy. That kind of brings us to a good transition, since a lot of these events were, as you just mentioned, rooted in warfare and things that soldiers would do. Um, later on, combat sports did become very popular in the ancient Olympic Games, even though they did come along a little bit later on. Um, and one thing that was interesting is whether it was wrestling or boxing, or um, another event we'll talk about in a second called the Pancration, it appears that athletes were actually chosen by lot. So when they were figuring out the matchups, there was, a, I guess, a little bit of dice rolling, and you faced who you faced. Wrestling was added in 708 BC, and Unlike today's version where you get points, the winner appears to have been whoever forced their opponent to the ground uh, three times. And some of the sources that I looked at said that it had to be three consecutive times. Yeah, so so if you threw down your, comp your opponent two times, but then he threw you down, then it kind of like reset, right? Oh um, my goodness, that I could see that taking forever. Yeah, so the matches could go on for quite a while, um, but that seems to be how they did it. Now, boxing, as um, we kind of mentioned uh, back in our practice episode about the history of sports, that got added into the Olympic Games in 688 BC, and part of why it became really popular was it was really dangerous. There could be really serious injuries. Uh, people did sometimes die, so that's part of what attracted the crowd was that morbid curiosity. 
Uh, the boxing competitions, kind of like wrestling, uh, appear to have had no weight classifications, but later on it does look like they broke it down by age. So, <laughs> you could be the same age as someone, but completely different sizes, and if the dice put you together, then that was just the breaks, essentially. Oh, that's um, so sad. Originally, they would actually wrap their hands in cloth or some type of leather, and that was used mostly in the beginning for protection, but it did also increase the intensity of the blows to the opponent. Uh, so these straps of leather they were wearing were called uh, himantes, um, and they would wear them around the hands. And during the Roman era, so when the Romans took over the Olympic Games, uh, they decided to modify these a little bit. They were like, yeah, the leather's a really great idea, but what would happen if we put some metal studs on there? And so, yeah, they put metal studs on there, and that would inflict even more damage, as you can imagine. Um, Old school brass knuckles. And, you know, at the end of the day, the goal in boxing was to just knock out the opponent or cause them to quit. Okay, so there wasn't a time limit. Like we think of boxing today, there weren't rounds where they would take breaks. Uh, it was just pulverize the other guy. Um, and however long that takes is however long it takes. So athletes could indicate their surrender if they wanted to give up by raising up their index finger. So you had to be careful about trying to tell people you were number one because that would be seen as a sign of quitting. Um, in fact, there was uh, one story that I read that said that they didn't want to give any indication that they might be close to quitting and that they were in pain. So there was a story about one ancient Olympian boxer who actually swallowed his own teeth when they got knocked out so that he could save face. He didn't want to spit out the teeth where the opponent would know, like, oh, I've almost got him. So he just swallowed them. I wonder, did he, of... en did he end up winning? <laughs> did he pull it out? I mean, was it worth it? Um, the story I read did not say. <laughs> <laughs> Come on! But, uh, but you would think that maybe he did. Otherwise, why would that story be around to right. this day, right? Um, now, boxers uh, who could not be separated, uh, if there was no winner before sundown, because that's essentially when they couldn't box anymore, uh, they could opt to go for what was called uh, a climax, but spelled with a K when it's transliterated from Greek. And essentially what that meant was they could each get a free hit and inflict as much damage as possible. They would use a coin toss to decide who would go first in the climax. And in one case, the competitor actually pulled out the other guy's intestines, but he was disqualified because that was more than one move. <laughs> you were only allowed the one move. So the other guy um, died, but he was declared the victor because he didn't use more than one move. <laughs> wow. That is yeah, so what, sick. <laughs> yeah, so it was possible to win the, um, you know, to be an Olympic champ, but not survive <laughs> to tell the tale. Um, other people would tell your tale. That's why we're here today. Um, and that kind of leads us into the third form of combat sport that was created in the ancient Olympic Games. Uh, we do not have a comparison for this one today, and you're, you're about to find out why. But it was a form of wrestling called Pankration. Okay, uh, It debuted in 648 BC, and it became one of the most popular events for people to attend. Now, Pankratian kind of loosely translates to all-power fighting. It was incredibly dangerous. It was essentially a mixture of wrestling, boxing, um, you know, maybe a, a bit of UFC-style fighting <laughs> thrown in. Uh, very, very few rules. In fact, only two rules that I could find in my research. No biting and no eye gouging. Okay. Well, Mike Tyson would be out. Right. Everything else was pretty much fair play. And you just needed to get your opponent on the ground, finish off the opponent through, you know, things like strangulation um, or getting their arms and legs locked. And similar to boxing, um, you could raise your finger to indicate that you wanted out, that you wanted to quit. So if you didn't want to go through strangulation, 
go figure. Um, you could raise your finger and say, yep, I quit. I'm out. The other guy wins. Okay. One fun fact that I discovered from a source is that apparently wrestlers and competitors in the Pink Radian <laughs> were, would be covered in oil before they would compete. Hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of a slippery and messy um, event. And obviously that would make it more difficult to pin your opponent down. Uh, but what that made me think of was, uh, you know, Pita Tarfa Tufa from Tonga. Uh, he's really just continuing that tradition of slathering yourself in oil for the Olympic Games. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves Pita. Whether he realized it or not, he was just taking a, a page out of history there. So another um, reason, another reason to love the guy. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about chariot racing, because that's not something we really see anymore. Which is somewhat unfortunate, but probably for the best. Yeah. Uh, chariot racing was added in 680 BC. And no surprise, uh, chariot races attracted the largest numbers of spectators. Because um, it seems like it's one of those things that certainly would have been a big deal um, with what we know. So there were two main events. The first event involved two horses and was called Baiga. Uh, and then there were four horses. In, well, the other event involved four horses, and that was called Quadriga. Um, so mm -hmm. two, by four, quad. Easy to remember. Oh, makes um, sense. Yep. Yeah. And then there was the Tethrypon, Tethrypon, um, mm -hmm. and that was a four horse chariot race that was added in 680 BC, uh, with 10 or 12 circuits of the Hippodrome. This was definitely a rich person sport because it would require stables uh, and the Hippodrome. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Much, yeah. much of something that we're familiar with now. Um, yep. the Hippodrome was probably about 800 meters, but it's not known for sure. So to visualize that, that would be two laps around what we consider to be the modern track. Um, again, right. we don't know for sure, but probably somewhere close to that. Um, a fun fact is that the owner was the winner, not the driver or the horses. Uh, so yeah, you could work hard. You could race hard, but it's the owner who was the winner. Not the driver. Seems um, completely fair. <laughs> yeah, right. Once again, if you've got the money, <laughs> then you're good. The The drivers were usually slaves <laughs> or employees of the owners. Um, and there was a V formation start for the race. Hmm. Um, I wonder how they determined who was the point of the V formation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of confusing, too. You know, my son was asking me recently why they do a staggered start in track. And I was explaining, well, that's because the outside lane is actually the longest. So for them to run the same amount of time or same distance, they have to make it fair with a staggered start. The V formation, I, maybe it was a safety thing. Maybe if they had them staggered or something, maybe it was too likely that they would all run into each other at the beginning and then there would just be no race. But how did you get to be at the front of that V? <laughs> that That's what I couldn't find anywhere. Yeah. Well, if I had to guess, I wonder if it would be if you have lots of money. I don't know. Just, just a wild <laughs> guess. Seems that we have a trend going on here that if you're from a notable family and have lots of money, you <laughs> tend to get what you need something about this race is that it was very difficult for the chariot driver to maintain speed and stability. Uh, turns could be very dangerous, which, you know, it's, I think about just trying to ride a bicycle. I cannot imagine trying yeah. to steer a bunch of horses driving a chariot. Uh, it, it would be really hard to maintain speed for a long time and especially take those yeah. turns. Have you, have you ever watched the movie Ben-Hur? The Actually, old movie with Charlton I... Heston? I have not. Okay. So even if you don't watch the whole movie, because it's like four and a half hours long, um, the probably one of the most classic scenes in that movie is the chariot race scene. But I mean, yeah, there are collisions. There are people getting dragged underneath horses when they fall off at the turns. I mean, yeah, incredibly dangerous. So, of course, a lot of these owners didn't want to race themselves. And as you mentioned, would send out really someone that they didn't 
care about, like an enslaved person or yeah. one of their employees who needed to train, you know, who needed to prove themselves or whatever. But yeah, you can see why it was popular, especially with the story of Pelops, if that right. really was the basis of the Olympic Games. But Absolutely. Anyway. Um, so speaking of those tough turns and trying to maintain stability, it, you know, probably doesn't shock anyone that not many teams finished in one piece. Uh, the mm. four horse teams were 12 laps and that's probably around 14 kilometers total, which is over eight and a half miles. It's um, a long race. <laughs> it's very long, very long. Um, Jeez. So I imagine that for the spectators that were enjoying this, that they probably would think, oh, wow, my guy's in front. He's going to win. But over the course mm -hmm. of eight and a half miles, anything can happen. And I'm sure that there were a lot of surprise victors. All you had to do was probably stay upright sometimes. A fun fact is that there were youth events. From 632 to 616 BC, boys events were added. Naturally, no girls. So there was a youth right. Olympics in ancient Greece, too. Um, there was the boys stadion. There was wrestling. There was boxing. And they had boys pentathlon in only one Olympiad, which was 648 BC. Not sure why only that time. And, of course, the modern okay. youth Olympics for us began in 2010. So that is something that we are still getting familiar with and still getting used right. to um, on a consistent basis. But... Kind of like we talked about with the combat events, they started dividing some of these things up by age. So it did give an opportunity maybe for younger competitors who, you know, just didn't have the strength or ability yet of their, you know, older counterparts who mm -hmm. maybe had been in some battles and proven themselves. So uh, they could kind of get their start a little bit younger, I guess. There was also an armor wearing race. So, you know, again, one of those things that everyone knows about the ancient games is people didn't wear clothes, but there was a race, at least one of them, where they did have to wear clothing, uh, at least some clothing. Um, and so this was called the uh, Hoplitodromus, uh, or the Hoplite race, uh, depending on the source. I saw different names for it. Um, it was technically considered a running event, but it was added in 520 BC. Um, and traditionally, it would be featured as the at, at least the, one of the last races of the games, if not the very last race. But they would run in hoplite armor, which was helmet shield and spear uh, they would run between two to four stadium lengths and uh, usually it was based on the idea of representing a war tactic for other people to be able to see right uh, so it was coming directly like a lot of these events coming directly from battle from warfare from showing essentially hey we have great soldiers in our city state and this was one of those things that maybe there was an intimidation factor to it a little bit of seeing these people in their different armor and showing how well they could handle it uh, in a contest. Uh, but this is where in my research I found that apparently they had to run around a post. Now, it wasn't clear on whether that post was the same one for some of those running events you were talking about earlier where they had to go back and forth. Uh, but apparently they couldn't touch the post or else they would be disqualified. So I guess there was an element of balance that when you were turning around, if you touched the post and you had to lean on it, then nope, you were out. So um, interesting. And then finally, the last event that we're going to end on for here. Um, so Sarah, did you know that I, I think I missed my chance to be an Olympian by maybe a couple thousand years? Ooh, tell me more. So I was a band nerd. Something I failed to mention uh, when we introduced ourselves in the first episode. But I, I grew up playing trumpet. And apparently trumpeting became an event in the Olympic Games. So again, we see uh, a little bit of music kind of showing up here. Uh, but competitions for trumpeters and heralds were added in 396 BC. It was held on the very first day of the Olympic Games. 
Uh, and the reason for that was because the winners, uh, which was gauged as whoever sound carried the furthest <laughs> away. Um, so I guess the judges had to just keep moving like, OK, can we hear it uh, again? I would like to see how that worked exactly. But whoever won the event, uh, they were also given the honor of announcing the victors on the final day of competition at the official prize giving ceremony. Well, that's uh, or, pretty you know, cool. Yeah, so it, it was considered this great honor to be the trumpeter for the Olympic Games. And there was a guy that I read about named uh, Herodorus of Megara, who won an incredible 10 consecutive trumpet competitions from 328 to 292 BC. So he was like the all-time goat <laughs> trumpeter of the Olympic Games. Um and if you want to um, dig into this a little bit more, uh, insert an archaeology joke here, um, then there's a chart of events and when they were added. That's actually on Wikipedia, and we'll link that in our show notes so you can look a little bit more into some of these events and what they looked like because we couldn't cover everything here. So uh, we're going to stop things here for now. Uh, in part two, we're going to get into talking more about some of the most famous athletes from the OG games and how the games eventually came to an end. But moral of the story for now, we owe the Greeks so much. So hug a Greek today or go eat a gyro in honor of them or do both. But uh, but yeah, we wouldn't have the Olympics today without them. And it's amazing to me how many of these ancient traditions uh, are still surviving today. All right. And if you enjoyed this episode. And we really hope you did. You can help share the Games Odyssey by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. You can also find us online at gamesodyssey.com, where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter for more Games Odyssey content. That's the word games and odyssey, O-D-Y-S-S-E-Y dot com. You can find us on our Facebook page, the Games Odyssey podcast, or Instagram at Games Odyssey pod, or on Twitter, you guessed it, at Games Odyssey pod. And then, of course, you can always help us grow the show by sharing it with friends, family, enemies who love the games. Uh, basically, just anyone you think would be interested in sports history or sports history. We will pick things up where we left it off. We'll talk about some of the athletes in the next episode. Uh, so until next time, au revoir. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content feature in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.